30% of our rotations as residents have to be site. So we do a lot of site. At the, we go at MUSC, we rotate over at the IOP Institute of Psychiatry. And so and vice versa, they're supposed to rotate with us. But they don't they don't do quite as much with us. But I think the history, you know, uh, Sigmund Freud was a neurologist, you know, so I think he's probably the one to blame, you know, we all uh, so we still we still rotate together. We've got the same specialty board that was started fifty years ago. So I think we're forever uh, inextricably linked. Have you done any um, neurological neurological research throughout your career? No, not really. That um, that is becoming a year that's offered. You can do a research uh, fellowship year. And MUSC starting a neurologic research uh, study. Uh, our, our, they're trying to get a subspecialty going with that. That's available, but I chose pretty much a clinical track. Part of it has to do with I did start school, I was in school, I was 30, so by the time I got everything done, fellowship and everything, I was 40, so then it was time to start work. You could go through maybe like an obscure case that you've had or a few, so you kind of get a, a feel of the kind of things that you deal with from day to day? Yeah, yeah, well, uh, you know, probably a real interesting case or something, I mean, when you're an intern and resident, your attendings will tell you all kinds of stories and things they've done. One thing stuck in my mind, Dr. Pritchard, who's an epileptologist at MUSC, he told me about a patient of his that would, uh, was a little kid, he would go up to the window and uh, he would do the blinds like that and it would, uh, it would stimulate him and he'd have a little seizure. And uh, I didn't think much about it at the time. But years later, I had a guy and his little daughter, I'm not a pediatric but I did some peds in my fellowship. So uh, they, he came, he brought her to me and said uh, they'd been to the pediatric neurologist and they thought, you know, she was uh, psychiatrically disturbed. I said, what is it she does? Said, it's the weirdest thing. She'll go up and twist the blinds and then she'll start shaking. And uh, so I went and got her a little pinwheel that you blow, you know, and it starts turning. And the pediatric neurologist used that. And I asked her to keep it moving for two minutes. And she was hyperventilating, which neurologists do that a lot to make people seize. And sure enough, after uh, after doing it for about 90 seconds, she blinked and, and started jerking like that. And he said, that's exactly what she does. And so she had a generalized seizure syndrome. And that girl has an identical twin who would, the identical twin would come up, his name Kara. She would come up to her dad and said, Daddy, Cora's getting ready to have a seizure. And Cora was just sitting there not doing anything that anybody else could notice. But sure enough, in a minute or two, she'd have one of her seizures. So some kind of communication going on. That's amazing. And then a couple of years later, the other twin began to have seizures too. So it's really, that's probably the most interesting family. There may be some consanguinity going on in that family. That might explain part of it. And that's probably the most interesting thing. Epilepsy is strange. So do a lot of people come to you with like, um, my child or my friend or parent has had this behavior, can you tell me why? Or is it, like are you looking at cases like paperwork and you're like, why did this happen? Yeah, well a lot of people, you know, they want mama or sister to come and be seen by a neurologist or you know, unless the patient is um, unless the patient is disabled somehow, they they won't come. You know, but, but we do get that a lot. When you take a look at my sister, when you take a look at mom or you know, grandma, it's usually older folks. And I'd like to, but we can't do it without the patient's consent. Yeah, a lot of people come from family member referrals. They're having some spells. Spells could be anything. It could be psychogenic. It could be a heart block. It could be epilepsy. It could be breath holding spells. So, uh, yeah, at this day and age, we almost have to have a referral from a doctor, a primary care doctor. You know, family members. I feel bad. This a it's a compliment <coughs> they want you to see uh, their cousin or their brother, but we can't really see them without a referral. Our insurance won't pay.
Would you say you deal mostly with older people? It's mostly older people, yeah. It's uh, Alzheimer's, strokes, mm -hmm. um, a lot of things like that. Probably being in Clemson, we've got a little bit younger population than most neurology practices, but by and large, it's um, it's an older um, older practice. I saw a lady today is telling me about polio that she had in 1927. She's uh, she's 97. She's got temporal arteritis. You could look at her and see her left temporal artery was just standing out. You know, so she's pretty much with it. That's a bad disease, so I had to put her on prednisone. So I'm tell her what's going to happen to her now. You see a lot of Alzheimer's patients? Yeah, we see a lot of dementia. <laughs> and if you live to 80, 50% of the population at age 80 is demented. Slightly or? It's a, a noticeable, where it's clinically noticeable. Wow. And there's probably a larger percentage of that, you know, or half of, the, half of that that hasn't reached clinical notice yet. What's your experience with pediatric neurology? Yeah, pediatric neurology, that's child neurology. Um, that's a subspecialty of neurology. Um, yeah, epilepsy, a lot of um, in utero strokes, things like that. It's, um, yeah, it's a very interesting field. Pediatric neurology is uh, also very much underserved. And a lot of that is uh, financially driven. There's this hard for pediatricians and any pediatric subspecialty to get well compensated these days, more so than adults, which have taken a hit. But uh, <coughs> mostly pediatric neurology, by and large, is uh, epilepsy. It's a fascinating field. We do that during residency. We do you know, several months of that with, with the physical medicine and uh, all of the AKA physiatrists, you know, physical medicine and rehab are also known as physiatrists, PM and R. That's a, that's a specialty in and of itself. Well, neurology tries to get a chink of that, so they came up with a rehab subspecialty. Basically, you finish your neurology residency and uh, then you do a year of physical medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but ba uh, basically helping uh, uh, design rehab programs for folks who have devastating brain injuries or spinal cord injuries, uh, post-stroke or post uh, some type of trauma. So neurology, uh, that's another subspecialty of neurology. PM and R. Some neurologists they call it plenty of money and relaxation. You know, that's enough. That's a subspecialty uh, in and of itself. Physiatry. Um, what was your experience like in med school? Like you were thirty when you went in. Mm -hmm. Did you have a family by then? Yeah, we. Uh, yeah, we had one daughter, and then uh, uh, Lee and our other daughter arrived there in residency. So, um, I mean, it, it was it was demanding. You know, I was busy in my work, and so I had to really think long and hard if I wanted to go to medical school because we you know, were doing well in Florence. And, uh, so it was really a big uh, shift going from the workaday world into just such uh, academic drudgery in some ways first two years on, in a lot of ways. There's no getting around it, that's what it is. But it was, uh, and so I had some, uh, I had some reactive depression from that. You gotta get your rest, get your exercise. I wasn't really doing that like I should. But it was quite a lifestyle adjustment. Uh, the third and fourth years a little bit. Yeah, they are. They're in the second year is much better than the first. Not, almost anything. There's almost nothing that compares to the first year of med school. I mean, it's just it's really drudgery. And if you get a chance to do, if you get a chance to do um, anatomy first during that summer, I would do it. That that makes that makes a big difference in your first year. Um, and second year is a little bit better. It's a little more practical. Third year. Um, 
it's kind of hard, but it's clinical, so it's very interesting. And the fourth year is just really kind of fun. You get to do, you get to design your own you know, program in a lot of ways. Going into medical school, did you have any certain interest in urology, or did that kind of develop once you started taking more like urologically based classes? Yeah, that's a good question. I had a family friend who was a neurologist, and he he kind of. Um, he also helped encourage me to go to med school. I thought I wanted to do neurology. And uh, like I said, that's the only one I liked. And, um, and that's the only one they asked me to come back. And so I did a couple as a fourth year and uh, spent some time with a neurologist. Then I had a handshake agreement that I wouldn't go to the match. And uh, they would just take me on as a neurology intern. And I would do my year of internal medicine and then go all the way through. So I didn't go, I didn't do anything on match day. And then, yeah, and then the dean called me that night. He said, Jim, you didn't match. I said, yes, sir, Dr. Delvini, I know. I had a handshake agreement with, what? You did what? So I had to go down on scramble day on that match day. And uh, it's pretty neat, really. They give you this phone book of all the programs across the country. I mean, there's like Hawaii, physical medicine, all these programs that are still available. And so I was just sitting at noon, you're supposed to start calling. So I was just looking through the book, and, boy, this is neat. And then Dr. Hogan, the chairman of neurology, walked in. And, Tim, I'm so sorry. This is all my fault. And he took me away. And so, but anyway, if you if you ever decide to go through Scramble Day, if you don't have a family and want to just take a chance, you can get some really neat uh, residences all over the country. Is that after? Is that the day after, uh, like, day after match day? After yeah, yeah, you know, everybody gets where they're... Everything that's still open? Yeah, and it's an amazing number of places that are still open. I mean, I wouldn't really advise you to do that. <laughs> I don't know, it's something to think about. There have been times when a patient comes in and you've never seen him before, you just look at him and say, and you know what they have. Just by the way they walk or mm -hmm. by the way their face looks or something like that. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, we had a patient like that the other day with, um, you know, he got droopy, droopy eyes, and his temporal muscles are wasted, and he's got frontal bulb. And then he says, it was almost like a textbook description. He says, yeah, when I go out in the cold, my hands cramp and I can't open them. You know what? Like, yeah, he said, my dad had the same thing. And then my brother died with this, and it's, it's almost like it was all candy camp. He's describing myotonic dystrophy. You know, he has myotonic dystrophy. And you can, so most of the time you can look at people and tell. Sometimes you can't. But then when he started telling me his story, you know right away what it is. Yeah, that's cool. And that's another, if I hadn't done the spec, the, 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 the uh, fellowship, that's something I might not recognize because you don't see a lot of it. But then you hear that story time and time again in, uh, in fellowship. But yes, yeah, some this need to be able to do that. I guess you could do it just walking on the street too. That yeah. Like this, yeah. This. yeah, yeah, you'll cool. do it. Power. Well, whatever you go into, you'll do that. You'll see people like in airports or at the mall, <laughs> uh, or even in the paper. It was a, a few years ago, it was a family in the paper that you know they all sit there and had the whole picture, and they were all droopy. And I said, "Gee, where's the whole family's got my time dystrophy?" So I called. I, I called his family doctor and told him about. It. I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. I figured I could tell somebody. Uh, hopefully they'll get some treatment. But yeah, you'll do that. You'll see that a lot. In whatever specialty. I mean, there's things I missed that an orthopedist would say, oh, this is that. And vice versa. So would you say that most of what you do is like diagnostic related? Yeah, neurology does a lot of diagnostics. But we do a lot of treatment too. Sometimes they're emergent treatment, like in the ER for status epilepticus where people have having seizures and won't stop, or for acute stroke where they have a, a brain attack where you have to get to the ER in three hours and then the neurologist can give the clot busting agent. And so we did a lot of what we do is diagnostic. The diagnostics really have helped pay the bills. I can see patients all day long uh, diagnose and uh, see them for an office visit and go broke. What pays the bills is EMG nerve conductions. You know, so I, I do a lot of that for outside doctors. And that's where 